I guess a good place to start would be for for me to ask you what what your name is, so we have that on on the recording, and also a little bit about your business. Okay, my name is Jeff Hallowell. I'm the founder and chair of Biomass Controls. We're a public benefit corporation, uh, and we focus on trying to help uh, take down carbon while removing green waste from landfills and from the ocean. Great, thank you. And we were talking about your personal experience yesterday a little bit <clears throat> in our earlier interview, and you have a long track record in Silicon Valley, which is a place that I've also worked. And then you, your purpose, you had a change of purpose that took, took you to India or maybe arose from your trip to India. Can you discuss that? Uh, so I, I definitely had a technology background, as you mentioned, Silicon Valley with companies like Xerox, then Oracle and Netscape, and uh, then started looking more into healthcare. So my last company before this was uh, patient reported outcomes, really looking at um, respiratory health and also pain and using uh, questionnaires to be able to uh, diagnose that. And so Air quality became a, a real passion of mine. I have two uh, boys that have uh, that had asthma issues, and so we started off looking at technologies that could improve air emission quality. Uh, some of it we found was from uh, the processing of, of woody biomass or green biomass that was causing smoke, and um, from there we got kind of involved with the the Gates Foundation and their reinvent the toilet challenge, which. Um, realizing that um, billions of people do not have access to safe sanitation. A lot of that is the treatment of that waste and using a thermal process to do that is a very effective way to uh, remove uh, pathogens uh, from the material and also use it as a soil amendment so that it doesn't uh, go into the, into the ocean where it goes now. Mm -hmm. So what were your observances in India? regarding sanitation? Yeah, so in India, they have about 1.3 billion people and about 700 million of them do not have access to a toilet. Uh, there's even safe sanitation is considered a toilet that a, a woman could use that she wouldn't have a fear of being attacked, uh, which is a big problem. A lot of the industries there, they do not provide uh, bathrooms for their employees and even many schools, they also do not have uh, bathrooms uh, for the for the staff and, and students as well. So, um, so they just had a, a big issue there where a lot of this then is gets washed away if it doesn't end up in the air blowing around. But uh, people do breathe quite a bit of human waste going around there. Some of that particles in the air is actually from human waste that's going up in there. So uh, very bad situation. Um, and as far as women and girls, I mean, I think they take the brunt of it because a lot of the sanitation issues get put onto them and they typically do drop out of school uh, around 12, 13 years old because of access to uh, not only just bathrooms, but safe ones. Right. So you're a serial entrepreneur, if you will. I've been at a lot of startups and we've started a couple companies here ourselves. Yes, mm -hmm. I enjoy it. And there's a certain discipline in that and logic from the, um, from the technology development standpoint that maybe we'll get into later. But this led you to Alaska. We've just gone around the world. We've gone around the world talking about poop. When we started getting into air pollution, we really thought we'd be focusing more in the Northeast because a lot of folks in the Northeast like to burn wood, which is one of the major pollutants. Uh, but we found out that Alaska is actually one of the top 10 most polluted places, um, Fairbanks being the top one because of inversion and because of the cost of energy and the poverty that's there and people need wood to, to heat and keep themselves warm. And so they're reluctant to uh, take that away from folks because they can't afford uh, fossil fuels to be able to do that because it's so cold there. So mm -hmm. we, got, we got to develop some technology and test it in minus 40, minus 60 degree uh, temperatures. And so when 
uh, we started working in sanitation. We got a call again from Alaska saying, hey, it's cold up here. We don't have septic tanks. We, and in a lot of places, they don't even have toilets. And so the problems that we're trying to solve in India, we we're kind of surprised to see that they had similar issues in right here in the United States, primarily in Alaska, where we got called back. Mm -hmm. And you're working in a place called Kivalina. Can you describe that? Yeah, so Kivalina um, is a village that's located on a, a strip of land that is getting narrower by the day um, from erosion, primarily because of the ice continuing to melt uh, due to global warming. Uh, it's the city, you know, buildings and things are falling into the water. So they're, uh, they're in a designated area as part of the agreement that was made with the, with the, the tribes and the, and the government, but they uh, need to move, but the urgency of moving uh, won't be funded until it's actually a disaster area. So mm -hmm. there's just a lot of struggle there. So um, they don't have any centralized or even decentralized uh, sanitation there. And so most people do use what they call a honey bucket, which is a five gallon bucket. Um, they live in uh, homes with uh, maybe two or three generations of, of family members there. And so uh, trying to deal with that on a daily basis is, is burdensome and um, even hauling water because they don't have running water, they have to haul it. And so they're very careful about how they reuse water as well. So it's about 400 uh, people that living living there, and uh, and they've been there for over a hundred years. So um, mm -hmm. it's uh, it's an interesting place, and it's uh, the people there are very nice, and I I enjoy them very much. But I think they're in a, a tough situation. Well, we'll come back to Kivalina. But you had mentioned that the scope and scale of this situation that you began to describe with the lack of sanitation and toilets is common along the west coast of Alaska. And we, we had talked about the Northern Bering Sea um, climate resilience area and efforts to protect that. And, and there are so many challenges. So they're not the only village that is having these problems and villages are being forced to move. Is that correct? Correct. There's about 300 villages that will be uh, subject to uh, the climate uh, change there and will have to move because their villages are being eroded away because they're along the coast and the, and the coast is being taken uh, by, the, by the melting ice. So it's, it's definitely a bigger problem and, it, and it's, it's gonna cost them hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to, to relocate and to move because it's not a, uh, it's an infrastructure that has to be completely uh, rebuilt from the ground up uh, to be able to support these families. And the figure that you just named, that's for Kivalina, right? Yeah, well, one village I know uh, in particular, they had mentioned it was about 100 million just for that one to, to, to move. So you multiply that by the hundreds of villages that need to move and, and it, it gets into the billions uh, very quickly. Right, and so is there kind of a shock and awe factor where nothing's happening because everybody's blown away? Yeah, two, two reasons, one is, uh, they're, they've been planning it for years of how they're going to relocate. Even just picking a site and going through that process is very is very tough. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of culture and roots to the where they are right now, and so moving that is really losing some of that culture. So I think that's an important part of it that they're uh, considering. But also, there's really a lack of funds. There is no uh, way to fund this until it is is a physically a disaster, uh, which is obviously too late uh, for us. So. That's another uh, factor in there as well, is that um, when it happens, it'll be kind of too late. And uh, how are they gonna survive for that first year with those temperatures is gonna be, uh, it's gonna be tough for those, for those people there. Mm -hmm. And just for your knowledge, and maybe you've seen this in some of the podcasts, we've talked to tribal people about the impacts of uh, cultural loss and separation from land base that it often leads to you know, dislocation, um, difficulties for the youth, drug use, alcohol, um, lack of opportunity, these kinds of things. Disconnection from family support, tribal support. Correct, correct. The, the more they get broken up, the more issues they have. And uh, it's really tragic up there, the, meeting some of the families who have lost loved ones 
due to some of these uh, challenges that they have is is really hard to see because uh, the people are you know really nice and compassionate but there is so much history and culture there that taking them away and breaking that up definitely causes more disruption and more pain uh, for the individuals, especially the younger ones as they're losing that connection uh, to their past. Mm -hmm. And uh, you went up there and rented a house. Can you tell me about that? Sure, so um, we had stayed in a house up there. Um, uh, we found out of, a few days after we had been there that someone had committed suicide there uh, just a few days before. So it was, it was tragic. We don't know the, the, all the details of that, but um, it's, it's a common thing that happens there where we don't really see that here, but, um, but people have struggles up there and, uh, and, and that's often how they, they resolve it, which is, which is terrible, terribly and tragic. Right. So as, as a serial entrepreneur with an engineering mindset, then you have dedicated a lot of time, effort, and, uh, and ideation to creating a solution. Correct. Uh, the systems that we deploy in India obviously are for a warmer climate. So being able to make technology changes to adapt to the cold climate was uh, really important. Also to have it uh, in properly insulated and working so that in these cold climates uh, it would work. But there, there is hundreds of villages that need it. And uh, we actually joined a group called Launch Alaska. We were part of uh, their cohort to accelerate our technology in Alaska. Um, they're an Anchorage based company and uh, we're going to be announced soon that we will be part of their um, portfolio. Uh, which we're very excited about because we know that sanitation is what we would consider a basic need, uh, you know, shelter, food and water and sanitation, and they don't have it in a lot of those villages. And so for us to be able to provide that and, and give them dignity and a better quality of life, I think that would be uh, something that we would desire to do and put some effort towards it. And we've got the support of Launch Alaska, which we're very excited, excited about as well. So what is the tech? Our technology is um, primarily our controls. So uh, there's a lot of systems out there that are fairly rudimentary. Uh, by, by adding technology to it and sensors, uh, we can manage and uh, handle it and the variability. So handling green waste is not like handling uh, fuel uh, that you would put in your car. It's fairly standard. It's not going to change very much. Um, they know what the energy is. But when you're dealing with green waste, uh, the moisture levels can be different, the uh, energy levels can be different, so how we process it, because our goal is to actually use the energy in the waste to run itself, and our goal is to be completely off-grid, to be energy positive, uh, to be carbon negative, uh, and really make sure that um, our system will run when there is no power, that it will generate its own power and run itself. So there's a lot of technology there dealing with um, combined heat and power, uh, the controls to do it and also uh, the monitoring so that we can have it transmitted to a cell phone or, or or to a server somebody that can help support it so that far away they can be watching it and anticipating things that it needs like maintenance or spare parts things like that so it's it's an right. automated so it is kind of a internet of things uh solution as well so it's sure. fairly complex for a for small refinery right so you're taking human waste and you're heating it up, right? Correct. And you're heating you're it, what? And that releases volatiles, and those volatiles are then used to heat the material coming in because there's a lot of gases. As you see, a, a log burning, it's really not the log burning, it's the gases coming off of the log. So the human waste has about the same energy as wood. And so what's left is um, we just try to heat it up um, to a fairly low, low level, um, below what we would consider um, full combustion. Uh, it's called pyrolysis, so it's, it's partial combustion. And uh, what's left is the nutrients and the carbon. And so human waste has about 50% carbon in it. It also has uh, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and potassium. And so those nutrients are important to put back into the soil. And so our goal is to try to uh, have regenerative agriculture is, is needed, is that when people are eating food, we really have to be trying to get it back into the soil. And that's really important for us is how do we recover nutrients from green waste 
keep them out of the landfills, keep them out of the ocean, and get it back to the soil that needs it to uh, improve uh, fertility and, and stop erosion. What is biochar? So biochar, which can also be called biocarbon, is basically when you're heating up a material that is uh, organic or from organic, we call it biogenic, could be from organic, and uh, you basically heat up and get rid of all the oils and all of the volatiles. So what's left is a, it's like a kind of like a carbon sponge. And that carbon sponge then has some minerals in it and some uh, nutrients, but also then can absorb other nutrients that are in the soil, hold them to be washed away. And it can also hold water so that water use is less as well. It can be used for water filtration for stormwater. It can be used in a building material. It can be used um, for odor and uh, not only odor in the air, uh, but also odor uh, in the in water. So sometimes when water is treated, it still might have a, a smell to it. So you can use it for uh, turbidity and uh, cleaning up the odor as well. So it has many, many uses. Uh, we could go on and talk about biochar probably for an hour, but there's thousands of publications on it every year, but it's kind of an old uh, thing that was used by the Amazonians to, as a way that they could feed their people and keep the soil rich. And we're just kind of rediscovering it. So biochar as a name has really only been around since 2006, but it's actually been in practice in a lot of uh, indigenous areas for, for over a thousand years. Wow, that's fascinating to use indigenous technology to solve modern day problems in an indigenous community. We're not really the discoverer of it. All we're trying to do is make it cleaner uh, and make it more um, automated so that um, you, know, you don't have the emissions from it. That's really our technology is uh, our patents are really based on reducing the emissions uh, while gener using that energy because emissions smoke is fuel and using that energy to actually uh, create therm uh, to dry the material as it's coming in, but also to create electricity. It's a multi-level solution for a community. It is, it is. Of agriculture, really energy, and remediation of waste, uh, sinking carbon in the ground. And I wanted to ask you, does human waste release carbon to the atmosphere as well? You mentioned it blows around, so I thought perhaps that was true. It does. It does. So for open defecation, for all the folks that, are, that are don't have access to a toilet, all of that carbon is then going back up into the air. So we're not putting it back into the ground, which is really important. Also, when you fix it as char, it has very durable. So a regular fertilizer and even compost will only last a few years, where the char could last in 800 to 1,000 years. So it stays in the ground very long. And it's that dark soil that people like that's rich and that holds all mm -hmm. the nutrients in there. So as the soil content or carbon content goes down from, let's say, 10 percent, 8 to 10 percent, which is a good level, down to about 1 percent, 1 percent is basically a desert. So as we're pulling carbon out of the ground, um, we're basically creating a desert from the land that we have unless we have a way to put it in. And the durability of that carbon is extremely important. And in the past, forest fires and brush fires and fires in the plains used to uh, help put that carbon back in the ground, but we've kind of changed that natural cycle. So we need a way to um, basically return to that cycle. So again, it's things that indigenous people have used for, for many, many years, and we're just trying to uh, reinstate that um, as a kind of a decentralized solution, which is, which is very important. Right, that's interesting. We talked about that in terms of technology development, how, you know, we started out with um, glass houses in the technology world and mainframe computers and a kind of priesthood of operators. And we, now we wind up with supercomputers in our pocket. That's right. Uh, not too long ago, yes, everything was centralized, even the computing world and the same, but, but in the way we deal with our waste, um, you know, even back to Roman times, uh, thousands of years ago, uh, we're still doing things in a centralized man manner. And we've realized even through computing that decentralized uh, works best. And we believe that every person could process and manage their own uh, waste uh, just like they did before those times. And, uh, but right now the infrastructure in the US is really based around, you know, a lot of the upgrades and the technology and the infrastructure happened around World War II right after there. And it was a centralized based solution primarily for small cities 
uh, in large cities, but in rural and peri-urban, they don't really have any solutions. So they're, they're forced to bring their waste to a larger facility. And so uh, what we really need in, in, in the United States is a, a focus also on a decentralized strategy that we need to be looking at how are we going to handle waste and not move it around? How are we going to reduce that carbon footprint? How are we going to take those nutrients from those uh, communities and put it back into the ground where it belongs? So I think there's some policy that has to happen there and a different way of thinking, really transformational thinking to say, we've got to look at other models. We can't just have centralized models. We have to do decentralized. It's obviously worked in the computing world and we've got to start applying some of those principles to the, to the way we deal with our waste. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a lot of pressure on the Bering Sea as an important um, funnel, actually, for marine life from the Pacific to the Arctic and, and vice versa, depending on the time of year. And, it, it, you know, we have a plankton factory and a biological nursery and, you know, a lot of complex interactions. Um, in the Bering Sea. So is runoff from waste and things like oil tanks falling over like our friend Howard is working with and, and remediation of spills, that kind of thing, is, is the runoff problem um, concerning in the Bering Sea? It is. Um, we see that in other, in other areas as well, but um, we know that in freshwater, um, human waste especially will cause, can cause algae blooms. Uh, any type of phosphorus runoff can do that, which can be deadly as well. And when those nutrients are coming in from the land or from the landfills and going into the water, um, it is changing the ecosystem. Uh, we know that when polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons or PAHs are going in the water, even off in, off of, in the Fujian Sound, we know that that's changing it as well. In Hawaii, we know that runoff there of different nutrients going into the ocean is affecting the coral reefs as well. So there's a lot of evidence for it in both the cold water, like the Bering uh, Sea, but also in, in, in other waters, and those nutrients might be going to other areas as, as, because that, those ecosystems are all tied together. So it's, it's extremely important that we, we look at it uh, holistically and make sure that um, we have solutions that are gonna protect our our seashores, which then protect our, our oceans and fisheries as well. Mm -hmm. And um, we had discussed also that there is a new designation for the uh, Northern Bering Sea Climate Resilience Area, and they've, they've uh, gotten uh, some of the oil drilling uh, to be uh, ended there under that and, and so forth. So apparently the hope, the hope is to create, um, create a sustainable um, environment to the degree possible with native administration or native uh, traditional uh, uh, traditional um, observations and management. Have you have you worked with native tribes there on sort of larger scale issues and what they're trying to do to protect their environment? We we have and we work with some of the some of the corporations there. And what we're encouraging is a lot of the corporations that are up there have a, a commitment to sustainability and to um, United Nations strategic development goals. And some of them, not including sanitation, but also climate resilience, uh, life on land and the ocean as well. So rather than having them uh, purchase those credits outside of uh, that to territory, we're trying to encourage them to uh, invest back into, their, into those communities and to do that. So, Generally, a lot of them have a net uh, carbon footprint that they're looking to, and they need a carbon removal strategy as part of that. And biochar is a really good way to do that. And so by working uh, with some of these companies to do that and looking at sustainability as part of it and really investing back in the areas where you are taking the natural resources already, trying to um, repair the land and to kind of bring it back to Eden like it used to be uh, before we started up there, I think that's a good, good plan and a lot of the companies are there, but I think there needs to be easier pathways to do that. I know some states are really promoting uh, trying to uh, sequester carbon and to uh, provide climate resilience within their own state. And I think Alaska is on the way there, but I think there's, uh, there's some gaps that could be filled to try to keep some of those dollars. A lot of these uh, oil companies, for example, have committed uh, billions of dollars to help uh, with with climate resilience, but it would be great if they did it back to the place uh, where they where they recognize the revenue. 
Mm -hmm. Right. I've realized that there's been a lot of discussion and talk over the last 20 years from companies like Chevron, et cetera. You know, they have a lot of they have a lot of good words. So yeah. I, I wonder, you know, if that translates to actions on the ground or, politi or political and policy support, for example. I, and if there was some policy and, and if sanitation was at least a, one of the major ones that we could get done, it seems like a simple one that, that we could get done quickly and get done soon. Uh, as, as the world's trying to rush to these strategic development goals, it seems like at home here we're, we're missing the mark and not taking care of the, the people that, uh, that have been here long before us. Right. I mean, what happened? Did we, as a society, did we forget? Did we forget about them? I think we, I think we did. We, we felt like we, we paid them and that was enough, but I think uh, caring for the land, which is really what they did, is a, it's really more about stewardship. It's, it's not about the money. It's about taking care of what we have and, and keeping it there and making sure that um, the abundance they've had in, in wildlife and fish and animals there stay. And so it's really not a money issue. It's a stewardship issue. And I think we could all be better stewards of, of what we have here. Well, certainly with the new administration's day one actions to, um, to reinstate this uh, Northern Bering Sea climate uh, resilience area and also to join, rejoin the Paris Accords and, and uh, similar and other important uh, policy uh, and, and political decisions, uh, where does the engineering, it's kind of a funny question, I guess, but where does the engineering stop and the policy begins? Well, I think for us, uh, we're doing it really more before humanitarian issues. I mean, that's our, yeah. our goal right now is impact is really that we're, it's not, if we don't do something about it uh, by 2030 with 10 billion people and all that waste going in the water, I mean, it's just not going to be sustainable, not only just from an ocean's perspective, but also how are we going to feed, feed people in the future? So right. I think we're looking at that. So policy definitely needs to catch up. I see the Europeans are being more action oriented. So there's a lot of countries in, in Europe that are focused on carbon removal and they're not just talking about it, they're actually paying for those credits and, they're, and it's, it's uh, helping entrepreneurs uh, get technology off the ground. I see a lot happening in Australia as well and it's really being promoted and encouraged, but I just don't see that actual feet on the ground action happening in the, in the US. I think there's a lot of talk about it, there's a lot of meetings happening, but as far as um, groups like Launch Alaska that are being funded to try to help entrepreneurs, uh, we don't see that from a carbon removal perspective and from a sanitation and how do we protect our oceans. So we need, to, we need to put that into action now and maybe use groups that are already out there and, and help them to accelerate uh, their plans as well. So I think there's an opportunity, but uh, we've been talking about it for too long. We need to take some action here and we need to uh, get, make sure it gets to the places where it's needed. And I'm hoping that sanitation uh, would be, and taking care of uh, the people in Alaska would be one of the top priorities that they, that they look at. Well, that's a great conclusion. You know, I think, I think that focuses the perspective within the context and everything. Um, I was just appalled, you know, <laughs> I mean, the way you said it in our first interview, and, and thinking of the COVID conversation too, that I've had with others, you know, that there's multiple generations and living in HUD houses that were sort of like helicoptered onto the tundra with no existing infrastructure and stuff like that. You know, maybe they weren't helicoptered, but they were, they were, they got there somehow from wherever HUD houses are made, but they're not made for Alaska. So you have, you know, multiple families sharing space and the honey bucket situation and all of that. And it seems like a perfect disease incubator. Yeah, there, there are groups. There's one group, uh, Alaskan uh, ANTHC, who is trying to help. They have a program called PASS, where they are trying to put urine diverted dry toilets, uh, which were originally European designed, to put them in these homes so that they do have a, a better system. But that, that has been rolling out, but it's certainly going to take a while. Uh, and they still don't have the infrastructure to deal with the, the waste once it's, once it's been collected. So we're optimistic that the uh, the infrastructure is in place. We just need to accelerate uh, getting them the funding so that it can can stop sooner than later. Mm -hmm. And with you know the progression of our climate change situation with potential and existing methane release and you know more rapid melting, 
of glaciers. I mean, it, it seems like we could be headed for a wall on a lot of these issues, which would result in a human catastrophe. So I think it's been a catastrophe for, for probably about 100 years for the people of Alaska, and now we, have hit, we are hitting the wall. And I think as we're seeing the effects of climate really compounding that, uh, now we're seeing it as more urgent than ever. So I'm, I'm optimistic that change will come. Um, I'm hoping this administration that the money that they've allocated for infrastructure will go to these basic needs. There's many people in Alaska and throughout the United States that just don't have basic sanitation, and we've got to fix it uh, if we're going to ensure a future for the next generation. We're the most advanced society in the world, apparently. I keep hearing that. Right, but only in some areas. It's not for everyone. I think that's part of the, the, not only the equality, but also the equity. And I think this is an equity issue that everyone should have access to a toilet, everyone should have safe sanitation, and everyone's waste uh, should be managed safely. And I think that's a basic thing, and uh, a lot of people in the United States don't have it. And we've got to do it here as well. So I, anything you can do to help uh, would be greatly appreciated, and let's see if we can make a difference, because I know we can. Well, we've got a lot of listeners out there, so where can they go for more information or how can they contact uh, you or the other okay. uh, organizations that you mentioned? Yeah, so for our website, we're at biomasscontrols.com, but to learn more about um, biochar, there's a USBI, U United States Biochar Initiative, it's USBI.org, and also the IBI, the International Biochar Initiative, uh, that's based out of, out of Europe. Um, there's a lot of information on uh, SEG 6.2, which is from the United Nations. And also we've been graciously funded uh, through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So they have a, a site uh, dedicated to WASH, which is water sanitation and health and hygiene as well. So there's a lot of information out there. Uh, and I really would appreciate people focusing on decentralized sanitation and decentralized waste treatment as a, as a necessary solution that we need uh, as we move forward or we're gonna, uh, we're not going to be able to reverse the damage that we've done to our environment and to our climate.